So I'm going to talk with Mike for a while, and then we'll open it up for Q&A, and then he'll sign books. So thank you so much for coming. Thank really you. appreciate it. We would love to have you read some things, but I bet. Um, you know, um, I wanted to start off. Did your did your parents encourage you to read? <laughs> I don't remember that. No. Did you decide on your own to read a lot? Because I know you read a lot growing up. Yeah, I was a bookworm. And that was on your own. My own volition. Yeah. Yeah. And um, my parents were very working class. Reading was a waste of time. Really? So what do you think drove you to read a lot? I was a wuss. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so did they encourage you to go to art, art uh, gallery, uh, museums, or? Oh, no. No? No. They were against it. <laughs> and so early on, you aspired to be a writer. Yes. I wanted, I first, before I became a visual artist, I wanted to be a novelist. Because in, um, um, oh, by the time I was in uh, late, junior high school or high school, I was a voracious reader, especially of um, The Beats and, uh, um, well, Huxley was my favorite. And, uh, and, the, and then I went into all the new novelists, like Barth and uh, so on and so forth. Right. So what different skills did you develop that enabled, enabled you to become a successful artist? <laughs> As a, not, that's not a skill. That's that's a calling. That's you like, think so? Well, that's you're gravitated to what you can do. And I wasn't very good at having a nine to five job. And I gravitated toward the arts. And it, it's the art world is very different than it was when I was young. When I was when I was young, art world is where you went to be a failure. And it was a chosen profession. You chose to be a failure. And I never in my wildest dreams thought I would become a professional artist. Never. I thought I would be the rest of my life doing what I did, digging ditches. And, uh, and I never thought there would be an upward swing in the art world. You know? I don't know what, that, what I think about that. but. The art world's very different. I, I mean, I'm really one of the last people to so, like, where the, the, the art world was still avant-garde. Because I came of age in the, in, in the depressed 70s. And um, when there was no money, it was after the glory days of the 60s. So when I was a kid, I was looking at art books going, gee, look at these stars, like Rauschenberg and Warhol, and the wonderful life they lived. It was like a rock star. But by the 70s, that was all over. And if you chose to be an artist in the 70s, it was basically saying you were going to be a janitor. <laughs> and um, that was OK with me, because I had no interest in dominant culture. And so uh, the 80s changed all that. But I wasn't very popular in the 80s. And so it took a while um, for my brand of aesthetics to kind of catch on. That's a whole other discussion. Right. But, you know, it, it's, I was really a follower of the avant-garde. I was a follower of the beats. I was a follower of avant-garde literature. I was a follower of avant-garde poetry. I was a follower of avant-garde film and of avant-garde art. That's where I came from and of the counterculture. I was a child of the counterculture. I came out of a blue-collar family. They hated art. They hated intellectuals. <laughs> and. Um, the counterculture was my escape from basically a factory town. Mm -hmm. Well, one of those counterculture heroes of mine, I know, I think of yours too, is Frank Zappa. And he has this concept called conceptual continuity. And it's that sort of fine, thin thread theme that runs through all his work. Did you find, either consciously or unconsciously, that you've had conceptual continuity in your own work going from like, Painting, installation, you know, onto uh, performance and say writing books. Well, I think because I was coming out of the psychedelic milieu, I never made any differentiation between various um, forms of art. I thought the effect was what was important, 
And when I went to school, and when I went to undergraduate school, my teachers were basically Greenbergian formalists. And art to them was all about truth to materials. And I was going like, oh, I don't give a shit about <laughs> truth to materials. I mean, materials are what you make them do. Materials have no truth. There's no inherent truth in materials. So I can understand that concept. And, but luckily, through my own readings, like say in Surrealism and that, and then later Conceptualism, I understood you know, that all of these divisions were basically conceptual and linguistic divisions and, and they were false constructs. And, and so, um, I never was interested in this idea of, of like, well, I'm going to be the great writer, I'm going to be the great painter, I'm going to be the great sculptor. sculptor. I, 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 I didn't think that way. It's like, if I want to do something that's sculptural, I'll learn what it takes to be a sculptor. And I um, was more interested in ideas, and that's why I think when I was lucky enough to go to CalArts and be in this conceptualist milieu, they accepted that. Now, what was a problem for me there was that they were reductivists, and they were anti-material. And I had to reconcile this um, kind of, what I thought was a kind of I idealistic reductivism with what, with basically my materialist maximalism. <laughs> so, uh, um, that was my struggle. So you, you were studying effects, that's great. You're after studying effects. Well, and, and you mentioned Zappa, and Zappa was a huge, huge uh, influence on me as a teenager because Zappa was really one of the first postmodern artists like, if you listen to his music, like, he's one of the first to do, well, at least in the popular modality, uh, cut and paste. Right. And he was doing pastiche. Uh, I mean, he's one of the greatest pastiche artists of all time, and uh, he's, he's, not, he's not credited for that. He's always like the, the, the neo-dadaist jokester. But if, if you listen to those first three records, I think, I think besides Cage, they're the best edited records of all time and it's 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 pure um, dialectical pastiche. Very well put. It, it, very few people realize that he used the studio as an instrument. Yeah, and uh, I really liked it. Now there's certain things about it that you had to be sort of an insider for it, but I like that because I also like that he stuck to his own biography. Like, why else would you mix Murray's, you know, and Duwap? No one else was going to do that. It's because he grew up in Duwap and Verez. That makes him an individual. He's not an academic pastiche. And it's just, I respect that because, like, when I was coming up, my work is very much indebted to the, the universal things I was interested in, the international things I was interested in, but also um, a real connection to my uh, local culture and say, this is where I come from, this is what formed me, and if you don't like it, that's too bad because I'm a historical artist. Mm -hmm. well now, uh, 10 years ago, I interviewed you for KPFK, and uh, Gee, Wayne's celebrating being here at uh, Bergamont 10 years, so kudos to that. Now, I asked you the question, what's your favorite form of information 10 years ago? And you said the book form, that was off the top of your head. And um, does that still apply? And then what are your other top favorite forms, or you know, just maybe one or two? Well, oral communication. And that precludes technology, because you can have oral um, communication through the telephone or the internet or things like that. Um, the book form, because it allows a certain amount of projection. Yeah. And, um, and I've changed my mind since then. Now the film. Film is your favorite form? No, no, it's, it's oh. my third. Oh, third, okay. But at the time I hated film. But now I've warmed up to it and I, I, there's something about um, images and temporal movement that I like. And at the time I thought it was um, washed up. I, I thought it was so cliched you couldn't do anything more with it. And perhaps that's true, but I still like to go back and I, I like to think about it. 
And do you, do you mean in regards to like renting DVDs or going to a movie theater or, yeah. or just avant-garde films? I watch far more films than I used to. What do you prefer, a movie theater or a, or a home? No, home. Home? I, I don't like shared experiences. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's the beauty of uh, watching a movie at home. That's right. Um, the greatest invention is the, you know, the VHS player and the DVD player because you have to sit with a bunch of assholes. <laughs> you watch it and have your own experience. Yeah, and you can you can hit stop. And go you don't to have that. to go to the movie theater. Yeah. yeah. Now, they, also, I'm sort of agoraphobic. Oh yeah. I don't uh, like to leave my house. So when you can watch movies at home, that's a really good experience. And you can drink and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> they won't let you do that busy. Now, Mike, I want to thank you for being so articulate. It's truly a skill. I'm, I'm, I'm being honest. I, I, I listened to a, a, the, I re-listened to the tape that we did ten years ago, and you're extremely articulate. I listened. We talk about. Oh, I asked you all these stupid questions. We answered them so well. And then um, I listened to the tour of the Lachlan show, and there's some real great articulate uh, moments in there. The best thing about the Lachlan show is the visitors comment. Oh, I, I always go to the Visitor's Comment. That shows show. what people really think of Yeah. Oh, it. It's really the best way to see any art show. That shows what skip. people really think about art. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, no, it's true. I always skip the show and go I think right you should publish that. that. I'd publish it. Yes. It's great reading. All the shows are better to read the comments. It's like, you should be burnt at the stake. <laughs> I didn't think I was doing anything so bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I am serious, Mike. You are very articulate, and, you, and I think it's be, because you're an avid reader and you're an observant, what I call pattern recognizer. Now, could you give us or me uh, any tips or hints on how we could all be more articulate? Articulate? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I. How can you do that? No, I. You have to be more specific, I'm afraid. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to Get that. Get back to that. How about this? Why do humans invent or create? To please themselves. And so, back there in the 10 years ago, well, look, I mean, yeah. let's give an example. Like okay. If, if you see something on television, you know, even like a stupid jingle or something, and it doesn't please you, you'll reinvent the words for your own pleasure. So, very well. You know, you'll take the stupidest thing and you'll say, well, and that might even be considered creative, but you're creative to please yourself. That's, that's definitely. Do you think the, the, the need to invent is in our DNA at all? Um, <laughs> these are these kind of questions. I don't know how to answer questions like that. I, in my DNA? Creativity in the DNA. I don't think there's well, a creativity pocket in the DNA. Well, no, do you think we were born with this urge at all? Or is it, is it something like that need, that need developed? Well, you know, in Darwinianism, it's just, it's random. Like, somebody's lucky enough to have something that does that. And maybe that's more my, my attitude. Like, you're lucky to stumble across something that helps you, otherwise you'll be up Shit's Creek. Right. Because, you know, I, look, at I, I grew up in a lot of milieu, and like, a lot of the people I grew up with are dead. Why am I not? It's luck. I don't, that's not because my DNA was creative or something. I don't think that's true. I think, I don't know why. You know? I don't think it's... Okay. Well, how about this? Like, now, ten years ago, I asked you, if you what artist would you want to have paint your portrait, living or dead? And we both laughed at your answer, and I thought it was brilliant. You said the cave painter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm not that smart. <laughs> that is a great answer. <laughs> yeah, now, that means I've been along a long time. <laughs> now, why why do you think the cave painters were doing what they were doing? You know, your opinion, not the the uh, 
the anthropological. You know, it's really interesting because I was just down in Baja and I've never been there. And I discovered that, that there's all these um, cave murals in Baja and they're, they're just as good as the ones in France. Mm -hmm. And that means this was a universal thing going on. So people all over the place were doing mm -hmm. these cave paintings. And I, I mean, they're amazing. And I saw that and I said, well, people have always made images then. And some of them seem to be very, like, reportage, like overhunting. But other ones were very crazy, like snakes with wolf heads. And um, so, and they were trying to explain them, oh, their initiation ritual paintings or this or that. But they didn't explain the diversity within them because a lot of them were like folk art in the sense that they were completely um, the same. And yet other ones were extremely kooky. And um, so I, I think, you know, I mean, this is something people have said a long time ago that what differentiates humans um, from animals is, I mean, they have they have a, a, a kind of symbolic consciousness in which they can um, create symbolic things. And you might say that with well, some sort of repression or this or that or sublimation. But, yeah, you don't, you don't see that. I mean, I, that, that might even be the sign of, of humanity, is that people feel the need to create something to mirror their lives and their consciousness, you know. It, it represents consciousness, I guess, is, you know, and so even the earliest humans, and even very sophisticated, it's very sophisticated, it looks as good as what people do now, it's very sophisticated. So, um, the Balinese have that great quote, they have, we have no a word for art, we do everything as well as we can. You know, so that's maybe where they were just doing that because, you know. Well, that's a bit too cagey for me because I tr truly believe in the difference between art and life. Because I think art is political and thus it has to be symbolically separated from daily life. Otherwise it has no meaning. It, that's just why I really dis disagree with Caprile. Because I think unless you separate life and art, it doesn't imply um, conscious motivation, and thus it doesn't imply will, and thus it doesn't imply resistance. And art is the only arena left in American culture in which difference is tolerated. I mean, I don't even think it exists in, in politics. So, I, I, I really think it's the last message, what really scares me about contemporary art is the merging of it with uh, in the entertainment industry. Because then, um, once the entertainment industry can produce fake resistance, mm -hmm. then you don't have real resistance. And, and, I, and art is always the only, because art is so universally hated in America. Uh, Except England's the only place maybe in the world where they hate art more. <laughs> um, if you were in that milieu, you could kind of basically do what you want to do. But now, it's not true. Like, if you're in, in the art world, you know, you can, oh gosh, I could be on the MTV next, you know, after hours party. Right. And, well, I don't like that. I wish it was still a bunch of geeks. Yeah. I don't like that it's a bunch of hipsters anymore. Right. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> or you can uh, then go make a feature film. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's be an artist and go make a feature film. So the symbolist, which you you probably read a lot of symbolists. Yeah. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and then Anna McLuhan said that everything that we invent is an extension of some human sensorium. So clothing is an extension of our skin. Let's say. And uh, the wheel's an extension of our foot. And uh, electricity's an extension of our central nervous system. Let's just take three things you've worked with. And what do you think they're, what human sensorium are they extending? Take uh, the, the paintbrush. Oh, come on. 
Like, you can take a lot of LSD and, you know, ooh, and you see the world all scrambled. And when you come back, you go, well, how do I make sense of the world in which I perceive it normally versus a kind of chemical disruption of that? You know, obviously there's a reason that you see the world in the way it is. It has a social function in some way, or it has a, a rationale, otherwise it, it wouldn't be that way. So you have to realize whether it's good for you or it's not good for you. Or perhaps there's aspects of it that are good and aspects that are bad. Like, now a romantic idea of like that, like certain surrealist or, you know, like early hippie ideas, I think were romantic and they're untenable. Like if you're screwed up all the time, you know, well you can't function in any way. But on the other hand, I think it makes you realize, well, what's, what's the function of nine to five reality and what's the function of, of a worldview that's so codified. And, and also you realize that your synapses work in a lot of ways that you're really unaware of. And you know, perhaps it's good to go and examine those unconscious things. And a, a lot of artwork is really unconscious. I, 90% of my work is really unconscious production. But then, I have to make it understandable to the public at large. So I have to go back, take unconscious production, and try to figure a way to put it into a conscious modality so somebody can get something out of it. Now, it might only be to put it in, in kind of a bracket where they just say, I hate it. Well, that's at least a response. That's at least saying, I politically disagree with this worldview. But that at least raises a dialectic. And I'm, I'm really a Marxist in that sense. It's like I believe in kind of dialectics. And I believe in dialectical materialism. And I, I think that that kind of um, clash of, of um, experiences um, helps people. And I think that's what art can do. Yeah, Louis Vuitton's written very much in that vein too. Um, and Mike, I think what you're doing is you're a pattern recognizer. In that sense, you're getting a comprehensive view. You're getting a comprehensive awareness. Now, yesterday's New York Times had two articles in art. Yeah. One was about a four-year-old girl in New York. Her paintings are selling a lot. Is this the new Picasso? <laughs> She's four years old. She doesn't even understand what selling paintings mean. And her mom is tearful because she'd rather keep them herself, but she does approve of the selling because it's bringing in, you know, 200 grand and go towards her college education and all that. Now, I love getting kids' art out from the refrigerator art gallery parents curate so well, and then they throw it out. Okay. But this makes me feel confused. Why? <laughs> because I want to... I don't know what to feel about this. I saw the picture of her next to her painting, and you could see that it was just confusion coming out of her eyes. <laughs> like she well, what kind of, uh, was it a really socialized child art or typical child art? Oh, it was just like uh, swirly, sort of Jackson pollock -y. Like parents <laughs> say when they see Jackson Pollock, they go, my kid could do that. <laughs> You know, it was, it was, no, it was typical children art. All right. I think I might have to read something. <laughs> because I actually did a whole thing on, ch on analyzing children's art. And the series is called We Communicate Only Through Our Shared Dismissal of the Pre-Linguistic. Mm -hmm. And when I was very young in college, I taught in a public art school. And I taught kindergarten to third grade art. And I saved a lot of <laughs> paintings. And later, and when did I do this? Um, I did this in 1995. And so I read up a lot on um, children's, the analysis of children's art, and saw how um, adults use children's art to further their notions of um, um, psychic reality. And this was at the beginnings of this whole idea of victim culture. And, and so I really internalized all this language. And so 
Um, I'm going to read um, one called John P. Because nobody ever put their last uh, initial, <laughs> which is you know what you always do in you know, what do you call it uh, cases. <laughs> so so anyway, the the way these pre were presented was. A computer, you could bring up these images on a computer, and my analysis was there. My analysis was based on very stereotypical um, art therapy analysis of the period. And then you could go in and you could say, oh, that's terrible. And you could rewrite it completely on the computer and print out your, uh, your analysis, too. So the whole thing was about the idea of projection upon children's art. And, but then uh, it always reverted back to mine at the end, that erased that. And took it back. So um, this is um, about John P. and analysis of John P.'s painting. Um, and I think it was a, a sort of Halloween picture, like with a jack-o'-lantern and a ghost or something like that. It says, this work says as much about John's teacher as it does about John. The painting is obviously the byproduct of a school holiday assignment. Assigning holiday subject matter in art classes is not recommended. A weak student like John seeks to please his master by hiding behind a mask of compliance. The result is anti-art on the aesthetic level and hypocrisy on the moral level. This student has an uncanny ability to produce stereotypical art geared towards such occasions as Christmas, Easter, birthdays, and so on. He produces an art that is of an exceptionally ugly, saccharine vulgarity. This weak child's facile performance bolsters his self-esteem and could lead eventually to a career in an intensely socialized field such as commercial art. But at what cost? <laughs> By producing work meant to please his teacher, this child has become emotionally and aesthetically stunted. <laughs> a jack-o'-lantern is the subject matter of a three-year-old, and John should have moved beyond this kind of imagery long ago. There is a definite problem when older students continue to produce only bland and conventional artwork. John's teacher's preference for stereotypical art could be a sign that he is warding off dangerous negative fantasies himself, a supposition supported by his preference for Halloween assignments, which focus on antisocial imagery and depictions of death. The obvious intent is to produce a flattened emotional climate in the classroom. The deliberate encouragement of this kind of pseudo-art is a defensive maneuver on the part of the teacher who does not have the strength to confront, confront his teacher's mutilated and distorted personalities. <laughs> the teacher's inability to respond to his students' distress results in a creation of a consciousness hostile to understanding, a lack of true response in interpersonal relationships creates a worldview that is divested of meaning. This is experienced by the child as, quote, nameless dread, unquote, which explains the child's attraction to conventionalized images of horror, like ghosts. The cliché depiction of the terrible masks, the true terror of actual interior emptiness. All right, thank you, Mike. And that is from Minor Histories, which is one of the two books for sale tonight. So um, the other article in the New York Times yesterday was on Salvador Dali, and it talked about Dali's paranoia critical method of viewing the world yeah, to, I read that article. to celebrate the irrational. And you know, we have to admit, Dali was a master painter. And he, uh, if you could. That article was disgusting. Right, well, here's what I want to ask you. Could you discuss the power of the object, say the painting, versus the power of conceptual or non-object art, especially in regards to the Dolly statement that they quoted was, Dolly said, 
in reality, I am not interested at all in painting and literature. I'm interested in cybernetics and physics and biology. Well, that's something you said very late in his career, and I think that was to jump on kind of a McLuhan's bandwagon. But I will say about that article that what that article was, it was in the New York Times. Yes. And it simply only existed to um, continue this New York oriented view of art history that surrealism ended in 1939. <laughs> and, and so the fact that Dali continued, was one of the first art artists to overtly engage pop culture and to play with it in a really ironic way, was never mentioned. Right. And the fact that Dali's whole late career was basically Jeff Koons. And so by erasing his late history, it makes Koons a star. <laughs> That's the New York prerogative. Right. You have to erase Dolly to make Coons a star. The subtext of that article is only that. To stop Dolly's career in 1939 and keep him a Freudian surrealist is to escape the fact that pop culture was already in full throttle production by the 40s. Dolly was already there doing that. They have to erase his early work in order to create artists that the New York art world could not recognize until the fucking 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Dolly is a genius. Oh, yeah. yeah. And to make, to erase his genius, you have to stick him in a historical timeline that subscribes to the Museum of Modern Art History of Art, which is pure bullshit, and based on collectors and acquisitions and money. Yeah. That's all it's about. Yeah. Is that strong enough? <laughs> 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 uh, uh, without Dolly, there would be no Jeff Koons, and uh, without Dolly, there would be no Warhol. And by, a script, by erasing Dolly's late career and making him a hack, it, it just makes those New York-oriented stars stars because the New York art world is based on a phony star system. Now back to um, our interview 10 years ago, you brought up an interesting point. When your brother started to realize that you were an artist and you were getting press, he said to you, I saw your name a lot in the trades. Yeah. And you said that's because he was reading like Art News. <laughs> and, uh, and you made a comment about how Art News is basically a trade magazine. All Art magazines yeah. are trade, trade, trade magazines. Magazine. Right. And um, in the September issue of Art News, we got R. Crumb on the cover over the words, what's so funny about contemporary art? And you're quoted in this article. And it says, Mike Kelly said, Comedians know what everyone laughs at because they know what everyone represses. Steve Allen also said, behind every joke there's a grievance. And uh, Bob Dobbs says, when you're laughing, you're learning. Can you discuss the need or the, the non-need for humor in art? I think all art has humor in it because all art is about surprise. And, and so humor, is a kind of more socially accepted version of surprise in which there's a kind of cultural bracket in which, you know, you can be surprised. And um, I've never quite understood, it's only because of the pomposity of art that, you know, uh, say, the so-called so normal folk don't like art because they accept shysters and they accept comedy but they can't accept it when it has intellectual pretension. That's the only difference. Because I, I think art, you know, a, uh, humor is a basic component of art in the sense that it's, it's about, art to me is very much about analyzing visual language, decoding it, and using it against itself or exposing its conventions. That's what jokes do. But if it's not funny, or if it doesn't reinforce the status quo, then it's bad. 
And much humor in America is about reinforcing the status quo because what's being made fun of is those things which are non-status quo. So art is to me a kind of humor which is just um, unacceptable because it's threatening. You want to hear a joke about art? Sure. The little kid um, <clears throat> finally realized, got to the age where his, he realized that his dad had a job and went off to work. And he says, uh, so daddy, what do you do for your job? And he says, well, I teach people how to draw. And the little kid says, you mean they forgot? <laughs> I only know what part joke. It's one John Gold, sorry, told me, so you know it's gonna, what it's going to be like. Oh, please. <laughs> and, and he said, how many artists does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many? Fish. <laughs> <laughs> so ten years ago, we also talked about the use of metaphor. And, uh, and you're, you're, uh, you told me there's a lot of use of metaphor in your work. It reveals the world in flux. But then, and then you said, your students, that 10 years ago, seemed to be anti-metaphor. They thought it was too cheesy, and it was too literal. So is there any updates or observations of your students' attitudes on metaphor since then? A lot of art now is very anti-metaphorical. In, um, because art is supposed to be phenomenological. That is, you're supposed to respond to it as a thing in itself, and you don't need any side information. That's the very current attitude. It's shifted from that time in which we talked, in which a lot of it was a kind of post-minimalism, in which things were non-representational to the same attitudes being brought to bear on mass culture. So mass culture is seen as a pre-given, as if it grows on trees. And it's not seen as a construction or as having some kind of symbolic, um, like representing some kind of symbolic desire but simply seen as ipso facto the, the pleasure. So I think a lot of the same attitudes still hold, but it's now been put toward mass cultural imagery rather than, say, post-minimalist imagery, but the same mentality holds, yes. And I think it's a very anti-analytical um, mindset. It's one in which art is supposed to provide instant gratification. And it provides instant gratification because it is what it is. So you have a knee-jerk response to it. So McLuhan also said, the criminal, like the artist, is a social explorer. This reminded me of your pay-for-your-pleasure work. Yeah. Would you kindly discuss Stockhausen's 9-11 well, of course, that was ridiculous. I mean, what's, what Stockhausen said was, was a reality. He, he was saying that these terrorists, what he said was that that was one of the greatest artworks of the, well, I don't know, late point, so, something to this effect. And, of course, I didn't read that as meaning that he approved of it, right. but that they were smart enough to know what was a powerful statement. Now, does that make great art? That's my problem with the statement was I don't know if um, in Hollywood they call that. Um, well, it's a really interesting. It's a really funny term. It's called high concept. It means a term like it means you can describe it in one sentence and you know it's going to sell. <laughs> like you say, oh, uh, I don't know who's a popular movie star right now. I don't. Know. Tom Cruise. Okay. Tom Cruise plays Madonna. Okay, you go and you say that, and you go, oh my God, Tom Cruise, <laughs> Madonna. Sold, right? right? So, 
I mean, in one way, I think what, what he said didn't, didn't understand the cheapness of, of the act. But in another way, he knows, he knew that what they did produced the maximum effect. That they knew that people liked something that stupid. Like, you blow up the World Trade Center. Well, that's high concept. It's a one-line good idea. I can't blame him for saying that. That's a truth. Yeah. I don't see that he was um, advocating terrorism. So I see that as a kind of right-wing conservative uh, way to attack art and to demean that kind of analysis by actually ascribing to him the mentality of the terrorist, which obviously isn't the case. So I thought that the, the way the media jumped on that statement was to, to try to dumb down um, analysis of, of, of the, that kind of event. And, in, and that kind of, what they did was no different than the kind of way American media promotes war on TV. There's no difference. So you, you can't attack him for saying something like that. that. That was foolish. And that's, again, that's a way to attack the, you know, the left. A cheap, a cheap attack on the left by always saying that, you know, whenever you say anything critical, it's siding with the enemy. That's all that was about. Now, uh, you once said, art making is making your sickness everyone else's sickness. I didn't say that. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and uh, Joseph Boyce said, art is genuinely a genuinely human medium for revolutionary change in the sense of completing the transformation from a sick world to a healthy one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Boyce obviously had some notion of art as a curative process. I don't have that delusion. Really? No. I think, I think art is an analytic process and you choose to use it for healthy purposes or you do not. I don't think you can force people to um, be cured. And also I don't think art ever cures you. It just makes you aware of the problems you have. So what, what, what was I, what was it I was supposed to have said? Um, our art is making your sickness everyone else's sickness. Okay, well, I agree with that. In, in, ah. the, in the sense, in the sense that art used to be seen as a personal sickness that showed your genius, like how you were better than other people. In actuality, art is just saying, well, let's just point this out mm -hmm. and we can talk about it. I'm no different from you. I'm no better than you. I'm no special than you. I'm no genius that cut off my ear. I'm just another schmuck like you. And, and what I like about, say, Boys, for example, which isn't revealed in that, was like, he had a very egalitarian idea of art. You know, like, you can all be artists now, but in a way, of course, I don't believe that either. I said, a lot of people just don't have the talent to, to be, um, well, they don't have the strength to stand outside of culture and to make a fool of themselves. Like, he was a professional fool. And a lot of artists are professional fools. And what I like, dislike about a lot of contemporary artists is that they want to be hipsters. They, they're not willing to be fools. They're not willing to, you know, to put themselves on the line in some, in some shared emotional way. They want to be better than other people. And that's, to me, worse than the old idea about being the outsider and being tragic and, you know, a suicidal and all that crap. Instead, they want to be like a fucking rock star. They want to be better. They want to be Britney Spears. And it's like, I don't want to see a bunch of artists like Britney Spears. I, you know, kill them all. <laughs> so an artist going out with fucking Kate Moss? It's like, I don't care about that, you know? Jesus Christ, that's what everybody on TV does. Yeah. So I have no connection with that. That's why I hate Britpop. <laughs> Britpop, if I could say one line, it's about wanting to fuck Kate Moss. <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, Duchamp said, how do you make a piece of art that's not a piece of art? Well, Cage did it maybe with music for 33? No. Well, Le Duchamp me... never did not make a piece of art, and Cage did never not make a piece of art. That's, that's a game they played. That's a game they played to pretend they were doing something that wasn't art. Of course it was art. What else was? That's, that's real quick. <laughs> Let me finish. And, and then Joyce uh, wrote, a, wrote Finnegan's Wake, which is really, you know, invented the internet and disguised it as a book. And George Manupelli, <laughs> who we... George Manupelli actually is someone we both encountered early in Ann Arbor, Michigan, who uh, started the oldest experimental film festival in the world, the Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor Film Festival. Festival, which is, I tell you, I got my whole film education from that uh, festival. It was a great, great place for me to uh, view experimental They don't do films. things like that anymore. <laughs> and uh, he had a piece called Film for Hooded Projector. Uh -huh. So, um, why is it important to shake up constructed belief systems, and do we need them? Of course. What's, why else would you want art? I mean, if, if art, the, art, the only social function of art is to fuck things up. It has no other social function. Absolutely none. That's why if you merge it with the entertainment, entertainment industry, make it about the desires of the masses, it doesn't have any social function. Also, what's, it, what, what that idea about art, which separates it from politics, is politics has a purpose. It's about power relationships. Art doesn't have anything about power relationships. It's simply about fucking things up for the pure pleasure of fucking them up. So it's, it's about formal, um, it's about analysis and formal um, uh, scrambling. And it, 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 it both escapes the practicality of politics and the, um, what, what was the other side? I forget. Eh? Entertainment. Yeah, and entertainment, which is which is drugging the drugging the masses. So uh, art should be something in between. That's not practical in terms of power relationships, because it's fantasy. But it, it allows for power. Like art allows for power shifts over a slow time because people's minds change. Entertainment never changes people's minds, it just drugs them to, re to reality. And I completely agree with Marx in this, in this, in this, in this way. So I, I'm against the idea of, mark, of art being subsumed either into the political sphere or into the entertainment sphere. I think it has to be a separate social entity, especially in America. I think in Europe, the social and class relationships are different than they are here. But in America, uh, since it's such an anti-intellectual culture, um, it, it has to be a separate uh, milieu that's purposefully, um, what would I say, purposefully purposeless. It has to be. Otherwise, it has no social function. So, uh, you were trained to be a Hans Hoffman formalist. That's right. Now, an art student is being trained today to be a Mike Kelly blank. Not that you're trained them, let's just say. What would, it, what would the blank No, be? no, they're being trained to... No, I'm not saying they would, but if they were going to be trained, if some teacher was saying, I'm training you to be a Mike Kelly, what would be the blank? Yeah. A market-oriented neo-pop artist. <laughs> we're we're mm -hmm. coming down to the public. Community. That is a continuation of the '60s New York, um, like post-New York school. I mean, look at all the successful artists in the last 20 years. They're a continuation of '60s pop art, yeah. geared specifically towards the New York buyership. That's the market. If you want to be a successful artist, do something that looks like Warhol. Yeah. Or if you want to put a little spin on it, then you make it look like a subcultural version of it, like LSD scrawling. <laughs> you know, instead of being the mass culture of, of advertising, the mass culture of um, a 
youth culture oriented fake uh, sub subculture. <laughs> Kmart hippie dumb. <laughs> <laughs> or rave culture, or whatever you want to call it. So that boring people in suits can buy that for their own uh, repressed pleasure. <laughs> they can go and buy, you know, some LSD scrawling for their apartment. They can wear their jerry to see it done. Well, probably some kind of a Morrissey suit or something. Yeah. Um, Ten years ago, you can see how much I hate pop art, oh. and, and 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 how much I I hate that I'm affiliated with it, and how much that I hate being seen as the granddaddy oh. of all of this horrible um, subculture post pop work because it's completely antithetical to my um, politics. But ten years ago, you also I asked you, are we seeing it happen or are we making it happen? And you said, well, I'm basically a pessimist. Now, when they asked Marshall McLuhan if he was an optimist or a pessimist, he says, I'm an apocalypse. And the funny thing is, the word apocalypse is rooted in the Greek word to reveal. So, are you still a pessimist? I'm a grand pessimist. <laughs> now, George Bush, that's an apocalypse. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, a pessimist, I think, is somebody who doesn't believe in the bullshit, but hopes, maybe that the bullshit will stop. Yeah. But if you're like somebody who's apocalyptic or a nihilist, I'm not a nihilist. Yeah. I'm, not, I, I'm a very hopeful person, or I have dreams. I, I do not want the world to end. I do not, I do not hope for, you know, that's why I'm, this is the saddest period of, politically of my life. If I was a nihilist, if I was a true punk rocker, I would be as happy as a pig and shit right now. <laughs> because I would believe that's really what we're going for. But I'm not happy. I guess it reveals what an old sentimental hippie I am. Well, yeah. ten years ago, we both were thinking things are really bad. Well, it's kind of a lot worse. A lot worse. worse. <laughs> <laughs> a lot worse. Ten years ago, we were thought I'd be this bad, not me. No. So I'm, I'm more pessimistic than ever. I know who's going to win this election. That's not pessimism. That's reality. Yeah, that's Joan Darcet, uh, Michael Morris film will help Bush get reelected. <laughs> Every statement against him helps him get reelected because the population hates anything that's against the dream of, that he's proposing. So anytime you say anything that counters that dream, people reject it, which will make him even stronger because people want to live in a fantasy world. They want to live in the fantasy world of American hegemonic dominance. Well, I don't want to hog all the time. I really appreciate all your uh, patience and uh, brilliant uh, talking, Mike. Um, let's just close out my section with a couple quickies. What was your motivation I'm exquisite mayhem, the Tashin Wrestling book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to say that wasn't my idea. That was Cameron Jamie's idea. And Cameron Jamie's a friend of mine who grew up in the Los Angeles area and was an avid wrestling fan and who grew up his whole youth going to the Olympic Auditorium and watching wrestling and knew the promoters there and met Teo Merritt, the house photographer, for um, the Olympic Auditorium. And when he showed me this collection of photographs and introduced me to Teo Eric, I was amazed at the photographs. And because I had this previous experience with editing photography books, like in, in particular a book I did with Paul McCarthy called Sad Sadi Sak, which was a complete photo kind of novella, I, I had a lot of experience with um, organizing photos. And when I saw the photos, I thought they lent themselves really well to um, organizing. One thing that had never did, been done with his work, because he was a commercial photographer, and he photographed for wrestling magazines, and on the side, he photographed to make money erotic female wrestling for fetish magazines. And the two bodies of work had never been shown together. So I approached Tashin, and on the, because he's such a... Um, old-fashioned daddy porn queen. 
He was really obsessed with his underwear wrestling. And, I, and they showed him this picture, and he was creaming in his jeans. <laughs> and he wanted to put them out. And I said, well, only if you do it with the pro wrestler. And he didn't want to do it. And I said, well, that's it. You're not going to get the pictures unless you get that. And so the really fun of the book was mixing the two photos. The wrestling, to me, at least wrestling of the, of the 60s and earlier, like wrestling from the 60s and 50s and earlier, not so much now, because now it's more like typical mass culture spectacle. But then it was the only theatrical genre in which there was true suspension of disbelief. You don't get it in theater, you don't get it in films. But there, the people who went to see wrestling truly believed in it, even though it's overtly fake. And I really like that about it, and also it was something that really appealed to me because I used to go see it when I was living in Detroit because it was the only sport that was geared specifically towards those who hated sports. <laughs> and that you go, and say most people who go to sports, like say a baseball game or a football game, it's all about um, the American dream, team playing success. Wrestling is all about everything that's un-American. Phoniness, um, cheating, <laughs> and, and being a sleaze. And so when you go, in, in the old days before it became a kid's sport, the only people who were there were crazy old ladies, crazy adolescents, and pimps. <laughs> and so I had to respect it as the last vestige of a kind of critique of sports as a kind of American propaganda. And that's something that people just simply can't understand now because that idea of, of, of sports as propaganda has simply gone out of popular discourse. But for my generation, I always saw sports as, as propaganda for working together. It's basically like getting you ready to go into the army. And, you know, so, Wrestling, fate, yeah. And, and how about the first TV shows were Milton Berle and wrestling? Yeah, cross-dressing <laughs> and phony sports. <laughs> it's like a, phony sports about cheating. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just because I don't want to miss, I've already lost my train of thought, but just a moment ago you, you said something. You said you can see how much I hate having been put into this category. Yeah. And how do you think that happened? I mean, what's your perspective? It's because I was a, the art, of course, what, I, I came so early in the art world that, first of all, you have to realize that Manhattan isn't part of America. It's Europe. They don't understand American culture. They don't understand American rituals. They don't understand the American identity. So the fact that art world is centered there means that much of the work is still based until the 80s on the presupposition of European archetypes, modernism. Now, I, I early you know, started uh, pressing against that idea a little bit. But people who are an age younger than me don't have to do that because they don't even know what modernism is. So all the work they're making comes directly from their personal experience of mass culture. So the art world in New York was forced to change. They didn't want to change. Within two or three years, the art galleries in New York were filled with a neo kind of pop art that nobody there understood. The art critics did not understand. They didn't know how to write about it. They didn't know how to deal with it. But there was a collector base for it. So it was successful because it was, it was American. But what happened, and which is a sad thing about it, was that all the intellectuals there didn't know how to deal with it because they were um, educated uh, in this old-fashioned idea about art. So they couldn't, they didn't, that understand even the imagery or the terms that these younger artists were using. So they, that first of all led to the end of critical discourse, 
but it also you know, went to a kind of art world because of the economic success of this work in the complex language of mass culture, like you know, the difference between, say, well, as anybody, you know, especially if any kid or teenager in America knows, they know every tiny aesthetic difference between every rock band, every advertisement, anything. The difference between, you know, you put 50 skateboards in front of them, they know the difference. Mm -hmm. These people who were writing about art then didn't know that. They couldn't write about that. And so it led to the end of critical discourse and everything became generically pop. And so the new heaven became and this was going back to the 60s and the resuscitation of pop, like Warhol, um, the new heaven of um, utopian mass culture, which of course nobody believes in anymore. So it's a fallacy. And that's where I see the art world is right now. And um, there's, there's not, like for example, if you look at Britpop, look at artists like Damien Hirst, there's never been one good piece of art of criticism written about that work because nobody knows how to talk about it. They have no, they weren't trained to talk about that and most of them don't have the background in which to talk about it. So now you're starting to see younger people who grew up in the same hill you were the artists who are writing about that and things will change and it will become more specific and you'll see a real analysis of all this work. But right now we're living in a period where it's all uniform and everything is just generic mass culture and that's still because of the domination of the New York art market. And that at least is my analysis of What's this. about Los Angeles when I ask you that? Well, Los Angeles is different because Los Angeles has always been run by artists and there's no, um, there's no magazines, there's no journals, there's no, uh, there's, there's no critical, uh, it, the artists are the critics here. But that, isn't, that, that has no broad um, dissemination and there's no um, collector base here to support these artists and to make stars out of them who are strong enough in order to, pro to produce, say, a kind of uh, artistic um, uh, discourse, even if it's phony. Say, like, look at the success of Jeff, Jeff Koon's phony art discourse, which everyone knows is... is is fake, and yet it's been completely accepted in New York because they don't. There's no counter discourse. There's nobody who knows anything else to do with it. Here, the market can't go beyond about a forty thousand dollar height limit, so it limits the ability to have um, magazines and a superstructure in which art is important enough to have true discourse about it, except within the artistic community, which is a ghetto. It's the best city in the world for the arts, I think. Because I think the best art schools in the world are here. I think the best young artists in the world are here. And it's unfortunate that there's no venues in and which... The city has no taste. Yes. It lives in a city that's dominated by mass culture and Hollywood. Hollywood. And who hates art. And if they buy art, it's for prestige. So they go to New York to buy prestige art. I mean, that's a good stuff. What's that? That's a side point. The city has, has no taste. That's, uh, that's a good background. No, I don't think it is a good thing. I think, I think what it does is it makes strong and snotty artists who, unlike a lot of artists in other places in the world, are anti-intellectuals because they're rewarded for being stupid. Here you're not rewarded because there's not a, good, there's not a high enough economy to be rewarded. So, you know, once you get to a certain level, you know, you can only be rewarded for being stupid so far, like to the $40,000 limit. <laughs> and then after that, you've got to grow up or you've got to move away. Because you're dead otherwise. All the artists who are past, you know, a or if you, once you get to a certain economic level, you're washed up in Los Angeles. So you've got to, you know, go to New York and then try to kiss the butt of the Hollywood people who won't buy you here. Yeah. But then, then, you're, then, you're, then you're too pissed off to do it. So then you have to develop your own agenda. So 
um, that's why I think Los Angeles is a great city for art. Unfortunately, it's not a it's it's um, it's not a great place to develop discourse, and it's it, you know it's a, it's a sad place in terms of economy for artists unless you're very young for starting off, and it's and it's all about like buying your work for investment reasons. That's that's how I see it. Anybody else comments or questions? Yeah. This is uh, dropping back maybe 10, 15 years, but uh, I was remembering um, your installation a ways back at Lennon down here uh, when you had the, um, the stuffed figures. And I wondered if you had any comments about that. It was very affecting and disaffecting for me. Oh, God, it's like the work that everybody loves me for. It's my, it's sad. But that's, what I learned about that, see, I came to that work, um, I guess I'm going to tell you, I'll try to compress it. But I did that work in response to the rise of commodity art in New York. And commodity art in New York was dominated by Coons and Steinbeck, and it was all about the allure of the new product and commodity fetishism. So I decided I was trying to think of a way in which I could use commodities that weren't about economic exchange, but some other kind of exchange. So I decided the gift. And at the time, there was this utopian discussion on the left that gifts escaped commodity exchange, which I knew was a load of crap. Because gifts always demand repayment. And I knew that from my own experience. <laughs> like, if you're a kid and you get a, a, a present from your mom, you're going to have to repay that. So I decided collecting things I knew were made specifically to be given away. So I started buying handmade craft items because those were things I knew that were People don't make those things for themselves. They make them to give them away. And yet they were all in a thrift store. That means they didn't want them. <laughs> and why didn't they want them? They didn't know how to pay it back. <laughs> so by working with that kind of material, I knew that people would have an immediate, empathic relationship of guilt with it. <laughs> And now, what happened, which I didn't expect, was that they bypassed the guilt and went towards nostalgia. Uh. Which to me is just the repression of guilt. Nostalgia is the repression of guilt. Because nostalgia is about a past that never existed. That's the definition of nostalgia. It's not about a true happy past. It's about a past that never existed. So instead, I either got Oh, oh gosh, my child makes wonderful toys like this. And I got sent endless pictures <laughs> of all the toys that people made. Or I got sent all these heart-rending letters. Oh, you're so stuck in your infancy. You must have been abused. <laughs> I said, gosh, I really stumbled upon something here. And I didn't think that. I just thought I was dealing with the politics of gift giving. That led me to everything I've been making since because now all my work is about this presumption that art is the byproduct of abuse. Yeah. And all my new work is about that. And maybe if I finish off, I should maybe read one last little thing uh, that has to do with that. Let me try to find the perfect one. First of all, I'm just going to read you this short explanation I wrote about what I'm working on at the moment, which is, and I've been working on this for the last five or six years, it's called the Extracurricular Activity Projective Reconstruction Project. <laughs> and, and what I do in this project is I find pictures of normative carnivalesque American activities, like say, in high school, 
the one day where you're allowed to dress like a hillbilly or a greaser, which is the one day where you're allowed to be not normal. And to take those and see that is just an analog for art production. And so I've been collecting these pictures for many years, and I want, and I have been, first of all, I made this model of every school I ever attended with all the parts left out that I can't remember. And through the um, ideas of repressed memory syndrome, that means that I can't remember them because trauma happened. <laughs> so the whole idea was I would use these very generic photographs of carnivalist activities in order to prompt repressed memories to fill in the trauma that existed in these unremembered zones. So this is my explanation of this, and then I'll read a, a trauma, a recovered memory. <laughs> The extracurricular activity production reconstruction number one is the first in a projected series of 365 videotapes and video installations related to my sculpture, Educational Complex, 1995, an architectural model made up of replicas of every school I have ever attended. In this model, all of the architectural sections that I could not remember were left blank. My inability to recall these sites is explained through the pop psychological theory of repressed memory syndrome, which postulates that extremely traumatic experiences are repressed and forgotten. Thus, these empty architectural zones are designated as sites of, of abuse. The extracurricular activity projector reconstruction series is designed to fill in these memory blanks with standardized abuse scenarios based on descriptions in the literature of repressed memory syndrome. Details are provided by my own biography, intermixed with rec recollections of popular films, cartoons, and literature. Personal and mass cultural experience are treated equally as true experience. <laughs> the educational complex was meant to evoke such utopian architectural projects as Rudolf Steiner's Gothenium. Steiner's metaphysical organization, organizing principles have been replaced with a formalist base specifically the push-pull compositional ideas of Hans Hoffman, which I present as a form of institutional indoctrination and mental abuse. The choice stems from my own rigid undergraduate painting training in the Hoffman manner. As detailed in repressed memory literature, abuse becomes the underlying organizational rationale for all aesthetic production in my uber-architectural world. Like Steiner, I desire to create Gesamtkunst there a unification of architecture, theater, dance, painting, etc. Repressed memory syndrome and push-pull are the unifying theories at the root of all these varied productions. The projective reconstruction series consists of restagings for video of photographs of extracurricular activities found in high school yearbooks. I purpose purposefully chose images that are ambiguous. Outside of the context of the yearbook, they would not necessarily be recognized as school-related activities. Many of these images are artsy, cultish, or, per or perverse sexual overtones. They do not look like standard school events and be can be read as carnivalesque productions, symbolically at odds with the ordered world of education. I am not interested specifically in the aesthetics of high school and the age group associated with it. Rather, I am interested common, socially acceptable rituals of deviance. Hollywood, Halloween, Halloween rituals, for example. The project focuses upon yearbooks as a common source for such imagery, but similar photographs may be found in local newspapers, and I'm working simultaneously on another project utilizing photographs taken from that source. To downplay the tendency to see this work as reflecting a teenage mindset, I plan to use actors of a variety of ages in the video restaging of these photographs. Okay, so that's an explanation of what I've been doing for the last number of years. And I will read um, this part. I, I, from this group, of, I have hundreds of these photographs of extracurricular activities. And I started to write from free association abuse scenarios related to the imagery related in them. Now, I don't know which one to read. Do, would you 
rather hear the one about a father abuse or about Catholic damage? <laughs> okay. <laughs> memory number four. Mother and I were abandoned by my father at the moment of my birth. I was raised by her alone, though we shared a small house with her three sisters, my spinster aunts. As an only child, lacking brothers or even female siblings, my entire youth was spent in the company of older women. It was, was, it was as if I had multiple mothers, yet I craved male companionship and sought out fatherly role models, often with disastrous results. The memories of some of these attempts at male bonding are so painful that I have trouble to this day confronting them. In fact, in many cases, I can only remember certain places or situations while specific interactions re remain beyond the grasp of my recollection. I do remember a very kind elementary school biology teacher who took an interest in my mournful state. The anatomy of amphibians was a subject I was enthralled with. That, the mysterious properties of electricity, and Norse mythology were my passions. <laughs> this man and I would spend long hours after school working together on our special project, the dissection of frogs and the animation of their disembodied legs through the application of electric current. <laughs> Before long, I was invited to visit him at home where he lived taking care of his aged mother. This crabby and demanding old woman was an invalid who had been confined to a wheelchair for many years. Her crippled legs caused her constant agony, and in desperation she had turned to quack medicine for relief. Over the years, she had acquired a large number of mail-order gizmos that supposedly helped ease pain through the application of ultraviolet light. My teacher, I'm sorry to say, but I can no longer remember his name, would place attachments of glass tubing into an electric holder that caused them to illuminate with eerie black light. The different tubes were contoured to conform to the body's various curves, and with these glowing purple bulbs, he gently massaged the skin of his mind. She swore that this numbed her pain. I don't know if this was true or not, but I looked forward to the procedure for I longed to see the special light. I was completely enamored with the strange forms of the glass balls and the exotic lovely glow they produced. The light mesmerized me. Like two youthful Abraham Lincolns, my mentor and I studied using this dim illumination as our candle. Its plum rays guided our way through the pages of books recounting the exploits of the old Viking gods and heroes. Then, one day, my teacher offered me his greatest treasure, his own childhood collection of rare Thor comic books. Thor was, by far, my favorite of the superheroes. With his long, blonde hair, strong, muscular build, and perfect Aryan features, he was the image of masculine perfection to me, frail youth that I was. Thor was all that I aspired to be. I can recall vividly my heart anxiously thumping in my chest the entire time, our descent down the rickety stairs into my benefactor's cellar. I felt so excited. It was as if I were crossing the rainbow bridge into Asgard itself. This place we were entering was where the tomes of my desire were stored. I can still feel the dampness of the crumbling plaster walls. I can smell the musty odor of mildewed paper. I can taste the swirling dust upon my tongue, and I can see the massive antique chest just ahead of me, its heavy lids slowly cracked open to reveal its secrets. All of this was illuminated by, charged with, throbbing purple energy. The room pulsed. I, I, I can recall no more. <laughs> All else is buried in the hidden recesses of my mind. 
My surrogate father is no longer a part of my history. Nothing tangible remains to substantiate my memories. After that last pregnant image, no more, no more. <laughs> the storehouse of my childhood recollections is peppered with many more half-forgotten tales of wrong turns taken in search for a father's love. I recount some of them, at least as much as I can remember, at a later date, but now I want to push ahead to my adulthood and the most momentous experience of my life. I left home at a tender age and joined the Merchant Marine, for this had also been my father's profession. And though it was not a conscious decision, I'm sure on some level this way of life was chosen in hopes of discovering the fate of my lost daddy. The life of a sailor was a new and present pleasant experience, for it afforded the friendly company of many supportive men, who were more than willing to guide me into manhood. Every voyage to strange lands increased my sense of comfort with the world. I seemed to be more and more a part of humanity. Then, I cannot face the misery of recounting the long and complex sense of, uh, set of circumstances that led to it. I was dashed again upon the rocks of my painful childhood. For the winds of chance led me, long off after I thought I had ceased to care, to the shores that held my long lost dad. Oh, what a painful delusion it was that told me that my soul was free of desire for my father. How I wish I had that mistaken sense of freedom today. I found myself shipwrecked on a small speck of land far from anywhere. My home on this dismal island of solitude was a hellish cell made of cold stone, and the only other prisoner there, my cellmate, was my father. <laughs> <laughs> Our reunion was not a happy one. Unlike the prodigal son who was welcomed home with cries of joy, I was greeted with a sneer of disapproval. My father cared as much for me, the product of his loins, as he did for the handfuls of shit he threw out the barred windows of our quote-unquote home every day. To make matters worse, the series of horrific events that led to my capture and confinement in this hovel all resulted from the loss of one of my eyes. I was in a physically weakened state with only a gaping sightless hole in one side of my head. I was prey to my father's attacks. If I refused to follow his commands, I was blindsided. It was impossible to anticipate his blows. More times than I can recount, I found myself lying on the floor regaining consciousness after one of his surprise beatings. It didn't take too long before the pecking order of this foul coop was established. The prison was his territory, and I was his jailhouse punk. My food was his food, his work was my work, I was at his beck and call. And then there came those horrible times, and they were not that rare, when my father felt the, quote, call of nature, unquote. Then the crushing blows would come upon my dark side when I would awake again to find myself sore from being used. How loathsome! My father was old and ugly, but he was randy as an old goat and still quite strong. All of my moralistic arguments against the sin of incest fell upon deaf ears. Dad's logic was a simple one. I spawned you so your mind to do with as I please. This seemed only natural and right to him. He was God in his domain. A few moments of peace were provided by my father's own abuse at the hands of our captors. My heart was lifted at the sight of his torture, and the sounds of his cries and whimpers were music to my ears, for these were the quiet moments when I was free of his cruelty. This was the price my father paid for his domination over me. I, on the other hand, was never tortured by our keepers. I assumed I was considered just too insignificant to bother with. Strangely, we were the only men on this atrocious island. It was populated entirely by a race of white-skinned female natives. They never spoke to us, and I do not know if they even had the power of speech. 
Every once in a while, a high-pitched cooing passed from their lips, which I understood as a sound of satisfaction, but no other vocalization did they make. Their appearance was frightful. They were almost entirely bald, with only a few strands of hair hanging off their scalps. But in other places, they were quite hairy. They had rings of fur around their wrists and ankles, and they had extremely full pubic bushes. So even though they wore no clothing, there was the impression pool working together on our special project, the dissection of frogs and the animation of their disembodied legs through the application of electric current. Before long, I was invited to visit him at home, where he lived taking care of his aged mother. This crabby and demanding old woman was an invalid who had been confined to a wheelchair for many years. Her crippled legs caused her constant agony, and in desperation she had turned to quack medicine for relief. Over the years, she had acquired a large number of mail-order gizmos that supposedly helped ease pain through the application of ultraviolet light. My teacher, I'm sorry to say, but I can no longer remember his name, would place attachments of glass tubing into an electric holder that caused them to illuminate with eerie black light. The different tubes were contoured to conform to the body's various curves, and with these glowing purple bulbs, he gently massaged the skin of his mind. She swore that this numbed her pain. I don't know if this was true or not, but I looked forward to the procedure, for I longed to see the special light. I was completely enamored with the strange forms of the glass balls and the exotic lovely glow they produced. The light mesmerized me. Like two youthful Abraham Lincolns, my mentor and I studied using this dim illumination as our candle. Its plumb rays guided our way through the pages of books recounting the exploits of the old Viking gods and heroes. Then, one day, my teacher offered me his greatest treasure, his own childhood collection of rare Thor comic books. <laughs> Thor was, by far, my favorite of the superheroes. With his long, blonde hair, strong, muscular build, and perfect Aryan features, he was the image of masculine perfection to me, frail youth that I was. Thor was all that I aspired to be. I can recall vividly my heart anxiously thumping in my chest the entire time, our descent down the rickety stairs into my benefactor's cellar. I felt so excited. It was as if I were crossing the Rainbow Bridge into Asgard itself. This place we were entering was where the tomes of my desire were stored. I can still feel the dampness of the crumbling plaster walls. I can smell the musty odor of mildewed paper. I can taste the swirling dust upon my tongue. And I can see the massive antique chest just ahead of me, its heavy lids slowly cracked open to reveal its secrets. All of this was illuminated by, charged with, throbbing purple energy. The room pulsed. I, I, I can recall no more. <laughs> All else is buried in the hidden recesses of my mind. My surrogate father is no longer a part of my history. Nothing tangible remains to substantiate my memories. After that last pregnant image, no more, no more. The storehouse of my childhood recollections is peppered with many more half-forgotten tales of wrong turns taken in search for a father's love. I recount some of them, at least as much as I can remember, at a later date, but now I want to push ahead to my adulthood and the most momentous experience of my life. I left home at a tender age and joined the Merchant Marine, for this had also been my father's profession, and though it was not a conscious decision, I'm sure on some level, this way of life was chosen in hopes of discovering the fate of my lost daddy. The life of a sailor was a new and pleasant experience, for it afforded the friendly company of many supportive men, who were more than willing to guide me into manhood. 
Every voyage to strange lands increased my sense of comfort with the world. I seemed to be more and more a part of humanity. Then I cannot face the misery of recounting the long and complex sense of uh, set of circumstances that led to it. I was dashed again upon the rocks of my painful childhood. For the winds of chance led me, long off after I thought I had ceased to care, to the shores that held my long-lost dad. Oh, what a painful delusion it was that told me that my soul was free of desire for my father. How I wish I had that mistaken sense of freedom today. I found myself shipwrecked on a small speck of land far from anywhere. My home on this dismal island of solitude was a hellish cell made of cold stone, and the only other prisoner there, my cellmate, was my father. <laughs> <laughs> Our reunion was not a happy one. Unlike the prodigal son who was welcomed home with cries of joy, I was greeted with a sneer of disapproval. My father cared as much for me, the product of his loins, as he did for the handfuls of shit he threw out the barred windows of our quote-unquote home every day. To make matters worse, the series of horrific events that led to my capture and confinement in this hovel all resulted from the loss of one of my eyes. I was in a physically weakened state with only a gaping sightless hole in one side of my head. I was prey to my father's attacks. If I refused to follow his commands, I was blindsided. It was impossible to anticipate his blows. More times than I can recount, I found myself lying on the floor regaining consciousness after one of his surprise beatings. It didn't take too long before the pecking order of this foul coop was established. The prison was his territory and I was his jailhouse punk. My food was his food, his work was my work, I was at his beck and call. And then there came those horrible times, and they were not that rare, when my father felt the, quote, call of nature, unquote. Then the crushing blows would come upon my dark side when I would awake again to find myself sore from being used. How loathsome! My father was old and ugly, but he was randy as an old goat and still quite strong. All of my moralistic arguments against the sin of incest fell upon deaf ears. Dad's logic was a simple one. I spawn you so your mind to do with as I please. This seemed only natural and right to him. He was God in his domain. A few moments of peace were provided by my father's own abuse at the hands of our captors. My heart was lifted at the sight of his torture, and the sounds of his cries and whimpers were music to my ears, for these were the quiet moments when I was free of his cruelty. This was the price my father paid for his domination over me. I, on the other hand, was never tortured by our keepers. I assumed I was considered just too insignificant to bother with. Strangely, we were the only men on this atrocious island. It was populated entirely by a race of white-skinned female natives. They never spoke to us, and I do not know if they even had the power of speech. Every once in a while, a high-pitched cooing passed from their lips, which I understood as a sound of satisfaction, but no other vocalization did they make. Their appearance was frightful. They were almost entirely bald with only a few strands of hair hanging off their scalps. But in other places, they were quite hairy. They had rings of fur around their wrists and ankles, and they had extremely full pubic bushes. So even though they wore no clothing, there was the impression that their nakedness was covered by a pair of furry underpants. <laughs> Actually, they did wear one article of clothing, a hat much too small for their heads. This ridiculous item looked more than anything like a tiny flower pot perched atop atop their hairless domes. Their long noses hung like sausages over their top lips, and their eyes were beady and unintelligent. All of them were physically huge, with the physiques of football players, and each and every one of them had the same deformity of the arms and legs, the lower portion of which swelled out larger than the upper half. 
in a bell-bottom manner. They had huge hands and feet. They walked like apes, swinging their heavy arms side to side as they shuffled about. On occasion, a group of these women would come to our cell. Dad knew exactly what this meant, and it sent him scurrying about like a rat looking for escape. All of his screams and cries were wasted on these brutes, however. They easily cornered him, stripped him down, and tied him naked to a cross. Then their fun began, as they proceeded to degrade the old coot, poking and prodding him all over in every soft spot and hole. They slapped his face until he blubbered, yanked on his dick, and fisted him with their massive arms, all the while cooing like a flock of pigeons. They seemed to have no interest in gen genital gratification at all. In fact, they exhibited no sign of emotion whatsoever. They approached my father's debasement as if it were the simplest everyday chore, and got no pleasure from it as far as I could tell. At these times, I found my old sympathies for my father returning, and his after his torture, I would nurse him back to health, and my childhood love for him would swell again. It was sad to see this mighty oak of a man return to a little gray mouse, and I did my best to make him strong again, even though I knew he would show me no gratitude. As soon as he was strong enough, my abuse resumed. The most unpleasant thing about witnessing my father's mistreatment at the hands of the natives was seeing him made subservient. After all, he was my father, and it didn't seem correct that he, he'd be put in a submissive role. That was my job, both his son and his jailhouse punk. Then it dawned on me. Perhaps the island women did not torture me because they perceived me as female. My submissiveness to my father told them, much as, told them as much. I was, in, in a sense, one of them. But unlike them, I was truly female, for I was a nurturer. This is why, despite the many reasons to not do so, I sought to help my father become well after his abuse at the hands of these quote-unquote women. I had a biological imperative, an interior core of tenderness that forced me to care for him. The women on this island were phallic women. Their war with my father was over symbolic power. Theirs was a struggle to become the law, and I, as the only real woman on the island, was the prize in this game. Their whole existence became centered on taming the old patriarch. He was to be pussy-whipped at all costs. I then realized it was my duty to strengthen him, to bolster his position of male power, and thus preserve pure and natural femininity as exemplified in me. Otherwise, bad mothers would take over. Their example would become the norm, and femininity would be forever spoiled to be preserved in a perverted form. So, when my father was strong again, I approached him with the big question. I asked him to take me as his wife. Forget, I said, that cold hoop woman who was your wife and my mother. Forget the surrounding hordes of phallic torturers. I will be your mate, and I will bear you a child, and your power will live on through me, even after your downfall. And despite my father's cruelty, this child will be sweet and loving. I will make it so. This child will be the embodiment of love. This child will be the Messiah. <laughs> this, <laughs> the whole story is a remembrance of a Max Fleischer Popeye cartoon, uh -oh. um, in which Popeye is is um, is um, shipwrecked on Goon Island, meets his father. In jail with his father who dislikes him, and this is my my interpretation of the sub meaning oh. of this Max Fleischer cartoon of the thirties. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm turned up. <laughs> about the conflation of psychic reality and mass culture reality.
Well, thanks a lot, Mike. I wanted to end with just uh, Doug Harvey's compliment in the LA Weekly about you, and he said, you look at what the rest of us wa won't. So, thanks a lot, Mike. Mike's going to stick around and sign uh, books. Uh, you can purchase them right next door at Bird of Books. And thanks again to Rose and Wayne for having us. And thanks again, Mike. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.